All right, so we're going to start talking about what was it like in Judaism? What was Judaism like in the Palestine area? And this is going to be, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so let's, let's take a look at the, at, uh, at the geography a little bit. It's basically, as you've seen maps before of Palestine, you've seen how it is a basically a crossroads. It is a trade route uh, between Egypt and Mesopotamia. And it's been <clears throat> the ground by which Alexander the Great and, and, and all the empires from Persia to Babylon and Syria have conquered uh, that area. And so it's been constantly in the middle of everybody's backyard and everybody feels like it's, it's, in, uh, it, it's their right to have it. So since the time of, of, um, of the divided kingdom of the North and the South, Israel and Judah, we've had essentially um, uh, a, a, you know, one nation, one empire or another has, has laid claim to Palestine. Um, once uh, Rome conquered Palestine in about the year 60, that's when, 60 BC, that's when um, uh, Roman policies came into play. And it was easy for Rome to move in because for, because Alexander the Great had already conquered much of that land. And so the common uh, philosophy, the common uh, uh, language, uh, all these things led to an easy transition for Rome in terms of having control over Palestine. Um, <clears throat> Jews were mixed uh, in terms of their reception of Hellenistic Greek ideas. Uh, but finally, in, um, under the Maccabees, uh, in the second century BC, there was a revolt. And for about 50 years, Jews had their independence again. But again, as I said, a con uh, um, Pompey conquered Palestine in the year 63 BC and deposed the Maccabees. And uh, from then on, we had Roman rule. So under the time of Jesus, of course, as we know, it was the Romans who were ruling. And there were two, four different groups that essentially were uh, in control. Uh, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, and the Zealots. And I'm going to very quickly go through these four groups. But what they all had in common as different um, uh, schools, thought, or, or sects within Judaism is that they all believed in a ethical God, a God who was good and was concerned about the people. And they were expecting as well a Messiah to come. So the, the, uh, the, 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 the common... Um, uh, milieu, the common ideas uh, were there, an ethical monotheism and a hope in a Messiah and the end times coming. The Pharisees um, are, are really the inheritors of, of uh, a successful uh, Judaism or the, evol the evolution of Judaism. Uh, the Pharisees, uh, after the, the temple was destroyed, uh, were able to survive and move forward and keep Judaism alive. And, uh, uh, and, and they did not really welcome uh, the influences of the Greco-Roman world and Greek culture and Hellenism. Uh, they also emphasized a very practical piety um, where you displayed your, uh, your religiosity to the world and they wanted to apply the Torah to everyday life. They were, in a sense, the biblical fundamentalists of their day. Um, they were the theolo They were also, in a sense, the theological good guys that that that, that had great influence over the people. And if Jesus <clears throat> were to be closer to any group, it would have been the Pharisees. And there were actually two different schools of Pharisees. There was the Hillel school, and there was the Shammai school. Jesus was closer to the Rabbi Hillel school of uh, Pharisees, and it was common back then. If you saw a Pharisee from another competing school, let's say Hillel is walking and he sees a Shammai Pharisee, they were allowed to stop each other and question each other and debate in the street. And the, whoever was the winner of the uh, debate got to insult uh, the other uh, competing Pharisee school. So it was like a kind of a rivalry between USC, UCLA kind of thing. Um, but Jesus was stopped by Pharisees, questioned by Pharisees, as we see in the Gospels, and then uh, he answers their question and then gets to insult them. So this is a very typical kind of, of way of, of uh, they had the interchange back then. Um, they also ran the synagogues. And so 
essentially, and I, and I can show you a map here in a minute, there were synagogues throughout the Mediterranean, throughout the Mediterranean, which served as a great network for St. Paul when he finally goes on his missionary journeys. He, ha he can go to the synagogues first, preach to the Hebrews uh, and, to the, and to the Jewish population, and from there make converts uh, among Jews and Greeks who um, believed, who, who, who were sort of associate Jews called God-fearers, and they ascribed to most of, of, um, of uh, the Jewish teaching, with the exception of circumcision, um, because that's for an adult male is obviously not exactly something that males would want to do in the Greek world. And so they basically were able to uh, associate with the synagogues, be part of the synagogues without circumcision, and they followed other dietary laws. So they were a, a, a group that St. Paul was able to recruit from and make converts to. They, the, the, the Pharisees also believed in um, uh, angels and spirits. They believed in the sovereignty of God and prayer, the necessity of faith and good works. They believed in the last judgment. They believed in the coming Messiah. And they believed in the resurrection of the dead. The Sadducees, on the other hand, did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. That's why they were sad, you see. <laughs> so they are not well liked by the people they are not influential they are the priestly aristocracy they controlled the temple and so they were much more concerned about power and money and uh and um, and family ties they only believed in five of, of books of moses the torah uh the rest of the hebrew bible they considered valuable but not very inspiring or, or uninspired. They were cooperative with the Romans because, of course, cooperation with the Roman secular authorities means that you get to keep your power. Um, so they were very enamored, actually, with Greco-Roman culture. And um, Jesus didn't have a lot of interaction with them. Um, most of his interaction is with Pharisees. Only near the end uh, does Jesus have interaction with the Sadducees, probably in a lower court with the Sanhedrin. As I mentioned, they rejected the idea of the resurrection of the dead. They thought that was an innovation. And, uh, and so they were concerned much more with this life. And as I said, money and power. Um, they were pretty much at odds with the Pharisees on almost every, every point um, of, of, the, of their teachings. Then another group is called the Essenes. And these are the guys who basically had given up on Jerusalem and moved out to the desert to live a sort of a monastic communal life. Um, and um, uh, they had a lengthy uh, initiation process uh, for people in this communal uh, ascetic life. They believed that basically Jerusalem had just gone off the deep end and, and the, the, the Messiah was coming you know, a week from next Thursday and uh, they were waiting expectantly for the Messiah. And because they were expecting the Messiah to come very soon, they, they, they didn't um, believe that marriage was important, so they, many of them were celibates. Um, and um, uh, they believed in, also they believed in the pre-existence of souls and immortality. And so they were probably believers in, their, in, in reincarnation um, as well. And so that, and reincarnation does survive within Judaism uh, by the Kabbalists. The Kabbalists, who are the mystical side of Judaism, uh, believe in, in reincarnation as well. So those are the Essenes, and these are the people who also were very into um, scripture and to copying and, and maintaining the Old Testament. So we found their, um, their scriptures in a cave um, in, the, uh, in, in the, what are considered the Dead Sea Scrolls in the Qumran era, valley there. And so those uh, have survived to us as fragments, most of its fragments. Uh, and those um, show the consistency and the, um, actually the, the integrity of our Old Testament is that it's very in line with what they left behind in that first century um, period of uh, first century AD. The last group is the S as the zealots. And the zealots are, um, are the basically for the, the Romans considered them terrorists. They were looking for a, a political violent overthrow of the Roman government. They also, as I said, considered the Messiah to be coming soon. Um, they were um, 
uh, hired guns or assassins in many, in many cases, but they thought of themselves as patriots. And um, it's, it's um, uh, we have uh, one or two of these characters uh, who are apostles with Jesus. And it's certainly possible that Judas, one theory out there is that Judas was, um, was a follower of, of Jesus up until he realized that Jesus wasn't going to be bringing a political uh, revolution and then betrayed uh, Jesus. Uh, that could be one of the reasons that, that Judas was selected or Judas was the betrayer of Jesus. Uh, and we see that in history. We've seen that um, zealots sometimes uh, will turn on their leaders because they believe their leaders have, have uh, uh, just don't have it, what it takes uh, to, to make the revolution happen. We saw that with um, um, the uh, murder of the uh, Israeli prime minister years ago. What was his name again, Janice? We talked about this a couple weeks ago. Um, it was Itzhak Sabin Yabin. It, right, right. And he was murdered by a Jewish uh, extremist. Uh, so it, this is a, uh, what we see uh, throughout history is, is in same with... Um, um, Gandhi, you know, murdered again by a zealot who believed that he was selling out to the Muslims. So, um, so this is the, the 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 group of people who were living amongst Jesus and uh, and and were there and influenced, uh, in a sense, the New Testament and the formation of the New Testament through our Gospels. Then we've got Jews living all over the Mediterranean. We've got about six million Jews who lived outside of Palestine, and when uh, those Jews would come to Jerusalem, it would swell the population of the city. And of course, Rome, who was, had most of their soldiers garrisoned outside the city, then would have to come into Jerusalem during the Passover to make sure that there was peace. Um, so there were, as I said, many, many synagogues all over the Mediterranean. Um, and the synagogues were very, very important, um, you know, uh, as a, as, as a, as a as for as trade routes, as uh, as a place for St. Paul to make his his preaching uh, happen. Uh, those Jews of the diaspora um, were probably were, were Greek speakers, so the Old Testament had to be translated into Greek uh, for them for them for their use. Uh, it's also very likely that Jesus spoke some Greek, although we don't have that mentioned in the Gospels. Um, to, essentially, that was the lingua franca. That was the, the common language of the day. Uh, it's like English today throughout the world. You can probably travel almost anywhere and you'll find somebody who speaks English. Well, you know, back then, if you wanted to, to do trade and uh, do commerce and business, Greek was the language that was spoken by most people. Um, and again, having that common language of Greek allowed for the, for the spread of Christianity. These Jews also that were in the diaspora were very um, familiar with, with Hellenistic and Greek ideas, and they were very comfortable with those ideas. One of those leaders of that, uh, of that Jewish um, mix of Greek ideas and Jewish ideas was Philo of Alexandria, uh, who lived from 1st BC all the way into the 1st AD. And so he was that sort of person that it was able to take Jewish concepts and Greek concepts and pretty much bring them together. And so a common form of Jewish interpretation of the Old Testament was al the allegorical method, which was used largely by the diaspora Jews. Um, so as I said, the synagogues were very, very important for the people of the day. And let me just stop here and show you a map um, of the synagogues. Oh, I, uh, I closed it accidentally. So I'm, I'm just going to forget about that for right now. And, um, but, oh, there it is. Now, if you look at the map there, every single little black dot that you see is a synagogue. You see that? Mm, yeah. Yeah, so they're all over the Mediterranean. From Cyrene to Alexandria to Jeez. even in Rome, there were synagogues. Greece, all right, and that was a great, great thing for, for, um, uh, for Paul. All right, let's bring that down, close that, back to the PowerPoint, all righty. 
Okay, let's move on. Again, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask me. So what was the Roman Empire like? Well, um, the Roman Empire was able to bring political and social stability. They call, we call that the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. And because of Rome having control within the empire, it made it easy for Christianity to spread. Uh, Paul was able to, again, that, you know, Roman society, there was a common language, um, the roads were safe to travel, the seas were free of pirates, that had been a problem at one point, but now the, the, the pirate problem was resolved. And uh, so there was an easy movement of ideas and thoughts. And, um, uh, and so that made for a, a real good uh, ground for the, the, the growth of Christianity. Rome's religious policy was fairly uh, tolerant of many religions. Again, it was, the idea was, you know, tolerate their religions um, and, but with one essential key element and that was, and, and this one was a non-negotiable, was emperor worship. You needed to be able to say um, that the emperor was a god, even though the emperors themselves didn't really, uh, you know, take that too seriously or, or too literally, but it was a way of bringing uh, civic unity was that everybody participated in this one thing. The Jews, however, were given an exemption to emperor worship. The Rome, Rome had figured out that, the, that if you push that button with the Jews, they were gonna rebel and it just wasn't worth it to them. So they gave them the exemption of, the, um, uh, of emperor worship. Um, but if you did not worship the emperor, any other person within the uh, Hellenistic world, you were, uh, considered uh, an atheist, you were, it was considered treason and a, a sign of disloyalty. So burning the incense at the, uh, be, before the emperor's image was uh, a witness to their faith um, and, um, and something that, that, that early Christians did not do when they were still considered a Jewish sect. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. The Romans also maintained a, um, a pantheon of gods. They had a hall, a big area in, uh, in Rome and in other cities where they, they erected uh, statues and images of the different gods of the different uh, cultures and, and countries around the world as a way of, of honoring them uh, and, and keeping the peace. Uh, they, it was a sort of a glue that would keep that kind of uh, religious unity in the society. And so they uh, were tolerant of different religions and they said, you know, they're basically all the same gods and let's just all get along. And that was kind of one of the ways that they maintained peace. Of course, it makes for confusing, confusing um, you know, church history uh, to have all these different gods. There was also um, a lot of other religions called mystery religions. And, and, uh, and there were old, uh, these mystery religions were initiatory. They were not about, uh, you know, farming and, and you know, uh, crops and all that. It was, they were, initi they, they sought to initiate you into different levels of, uh, of secret knowledge and, and, and Gnostic knowledge. Um, and so uh, these mystery religions um, had certain common elements. Uh, some of them were, were like the, um, old mystery religions of Isis in Egypt. Some were the Persian variety uh, of the, the Mithraism. And one of the, um, uh, you know, Mithraism died. Mithraism was, was adopted by Roman, um, by the Roman soldiers. And they had a very interesting um, uh, initiation rite, which was that the Romans, and this was a male Roman soldier, very popular among them, but the, the initiation rite was that they would um, stand underneath a bull, uh, sort of a big bull um, uh, tank. Think of it as a big um, uh, you know, bathtub size bull, and it, it would have a little slot underneath in the belly area. 
But what they would do is they would fill the bowl, the, the bowl with blood, uh, feces, and, um, and the guts of the of other bulls. And then at the appropriate moments, they would slide the door and the uh, initiate would be standing underneath the bull and would be bathed, would be baptized in that uh, blood and, and feces. Oh, and, and the idea would be that they would uh, gain the power and the strength of the bull. Well, obviously, uh, the public health department would have a real problem with that kind of uh, practice today. And, but they didn't understand that back then. So it led to a lot of disease and death among many of the um, initiates. And so in a sense, Mithraism died out for, for health reasons, but also because other religions like Christianity became much more popular. And once Christianity became the religion of the empire, of course, you know, it, it, it paid off to be a Christian and uh, Mithraism died out. Um, much has been made about uh, the, the similarities of Mithraism to Christianity. A lot of that is actually um, not factual. Uh, it's, it's um, uh, so if you did some research on Mithraism, you'd discover that there's all these you know, similarities, but those are really uh, unsubstantiated and unhistorical um, uh, you know, affirmations about uh, the similarities between Mithraism and, and uh, Christianity. Essentially, Rome tolerated the Jews and they allowed them to exist as a legal religion with their own um, ideas. Uh, Rome didn't want to be bothered with the internal debates that Jews might have with each other about beliefs. In fact, for Jews, it was more important that you practice Judaism and do it correctly than it was what you believed. They toler Jews tolerated lots of different ideas and there was no one way of being Jewish. Uh, in the same way, there was no one way of being Christian. The, the, the eventual separation uh, we'll talk about here uh, happened um, uh, for, for, for reasons that had to do with the destruction of the temple and uh, Judaism, in a sense, you know, what we think of as, as Judaism didn't really happen for an, another, you know, 100 or 200 years. So we'll talk more about that in a minute. All right. So then the philosophical background that's, you know, that we see um, in, in Rome is that it is um, a, prior to um, the conquering of of um, Palestine and uh, Rome's empire world, uh, there was the Greek philosophy of Socrates and Plato. Um, and uh, for those of you who've studied some philosophy or know a little bit about Plato, uh, Plato believed that there was um, a, a, a good um, and there was goodness and goodness existed as an ideal, as something uh, in a pre-existent world uh, in a spiritual plane, uh, away from the material world. So there was a real sense of the dualism of spirit and matter. And, and that eventually um, became adopted by Christians and formed kind of a Neoplatonic uh, uh, philosophy that allowed for um, Christianity to be more accepted because of the Platonic philosophy. But it's also left its negative imprint on Christianity in that it is whenever we see ethical or moral theology that, that says the body is bad or you know matter is bad you're really getting Platonism there you're not really getting you know uh, Old Testament uh, Jewish Christ, true Christianity you're getting really more of a, a platonic model of Christianity and we've seen that uh, very strongly within the Catholic Church and uh, early Christianity, where matter and uh, sex uh, was a, the vehicle by which sin came into the world, and, and on and on. We could go on and talk about that forever, but essentially, there, was a, there, were, there were Platonic ideas, and there was Hellenistic ideas, and so these two philosophies uh, were the main do dominant ones of Platonic, Platonism, and Stoicism. We'll talk briefly about these two, and uh, I'll touch a little bit about maybe Epicureans. Yes. So, as we know, Plato was a student of Socrates. Uh, he was um, seen as a martyr for teaching the truth. 
Uh, the Platonists believed in the immortality of the soul. As I mentioned, the higher plane of truth, uh, that there was a, something good and beautiful in the world to, to, to aspire to and to uh, appeal to. Uh, virtue is, a learned, uh, is learned or a gift from the gods and um, that the physical world is only a shadow of the real world. So all of these ideas were perfect for Christianity's um, um, ascension. And also one could say that Christianity adopted some of these platonic ideas. And so Christianity changed somewhat uh, and has developed as a result of, its, of the influence of Platonism on Christianity. Uh, it's very difficult to get to the what was Christianity really, really like early on, because we've got to go through this veil, through this, you know, uh, veil of Platonism. Uh, and so Platonism sort of stands as a, as a veil between what is modern Christianity and what is ancient Christianity. And one of the people who was able to repackage um, Greek ideas into Christian ideas was, um, the forerunner of that was uh, Plotinus, who had a great influence on how Christianity developed and uh, how it was accepted by the Greek world. Another idea or another common philosophy back then um, was uh, held by the Epicureans. Um, and they believed, however, more in sort of in the, basically the pleasure principle, you know, live life here in the now. Um, and uh, there is no life after death. It's only about pleasure. And so you had within the Roman society, you had people who were just about orgies and pleasure and, 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 uh, and, and doing whatever you wanted to do. Um, and that your free will, that you have free will, but you're, you're not bound by anything that the family or duty tells you. On the other side of the coin are the Stoics, which was the dominant philosophy of the Roman Empire. And um, uh, they were materialists, determinists. They believed in, in, a, in a passionless life, a life devoted to the intellect. Uh, these, this would have been like, a, say, a, a, a Mr. Spock on Star Trek. It's all about, you know, keeping those emotions in check um, and living a non-passionate non life. Uh, they believed that um, God is everywhere, uh, uh, you know, and that, that God exists as this um, uh, supreme uh, being who is able to uh, be the source of reason and, and knowledge and um, they also uh, believed in that the universe had been created by these gods and there was a, a universal law that governed uh, the world. And one's goal was to figure out what that natural universal blueprint of life was like and then follow it and obey it. So observe the world, understand the law, which is natural to nature, and then flow with it. Sort of like a, a, a Taoist philosophy of understanding the, um, uh, the flows and the, uh, the way the world works. And if you can understand the way the world works, then you'll, you'll be happier. And um, uh, they also believed in a, a virtuous life. So, you know, and, and so the appeal to knowledge and, um, uh, and that natural law was a way to live the right life. And so Stoicism was very um, uh, attractive to the Christians. And so that formed uh, eventually in the early church, the understanding of, of, again, the Catholic church formed, took some of these ideas as, as, as in terms of their moral theology called natural law theory, uh, which again flows out of this idea that there is a, um, a blueprint to the world that God created. And so our goal is to understand what that blueprint is and live by it. That our problems are, exist when we don't live according to that natural blueprint, that natural law that uh, exists in, in our world. Moving on to the, what the church looked like in Jerusalem. And um, again, it's really hard to um, get a real clear picture of what the early church was like, because it's, you know, uh, there's a, we can look in the Acts of the Apostles, but there, there's probably a little bit of historical bias there. Certainly, you know, in, in Acts of the Apostles from in the latter half of the, the, of the whole book, it's all about Paul. 
paw, paw, paw everywhere. Uh, but it does give us a glimpse uh, of, of what existed and the tensions that existed, and the conflicts that existed. And uh, um, in Acts chapter six, it says the Hellenists murmured against the Hebrews because of their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. So it's not as if like they were completely against the Jews, but there was conflict between groups of Jews. And, um, and, and, um, and so there were, there were attempts as we see in Acts of the Apostles to try to placate these different groups. Um, a lot of the earliest persecutions probably happened um, and were aimed primarily at those Hellenistic or Greek Christians, the Gentiles who converted uh, to Christianity and um, were part of that like God-fearer group that I, that I talked about earlier. Um, <clears throat> there is a, a rabbi by the name of Daniel Boyerin who teaches at UC Berkeley who really has done some incredible, wonderful work in terms of understanding the development of Judaism and Christianity, and that these two groups coexisted very much uh, together and were really seen as one group. But then once uh, the, the war happened, uh, the, 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 um, the destruction of the temple in AD 70, uh, that's when the groups began to start separating. And we'll talk about the fact that essentially early Christianity began to draw borders around their faith to define a new identity. And religion, uh, Christ, the Christian religion existed to exclude heretics and exclude Jews. And Jews created a borders as well to exclude Christians. So each other's uh, identities got redefined later on. But in the time of Jesus uh, and, and in the early church under the, in Jerusalem, there was no sense of, okay, you know, everybody's Jewish. We just have different beliefs about who the Messiah is. And you can be Jewish and believe in Jesus, and that's okay. It's only later on that that distinction becomes really uh, important to the Jewish population and to the Christian population. So what were these early Christian communities and churches like? Well, um, these early Christians, again, as I mentioned, didn't consider themselves to be in a new religion. In fact, the word religion didn't even exist back then. The word, it was really more, more of a, the Romans considered it, and everybody talked about it as a philosophy. So it was a Jewish philosophy or the, Christian philosophy. But again, there were no borders yet. Uh, our Acts of the Apostles only provides us some fragments of what that world was like. Um, and the book of James provides us another glimpse of what um, uh, early church life was like. But again, it's only an incomplete picture. And uh, the Pauline uh, letters um, also give us a picture, but it's really more there. Paul's concern is really what's going on in the Gentile churches, what's going on, not so much back in Jerusalem, uh, but what's going on in the Greek speaking world. He realizes that, you know, the Jews are not going to accept the faith. And so his, theolo his theology that we find in, the, in, the, in Paul's letters are, is really aimed not at Jews, but at uh, the Hellenists and the Gentiles who, who converted to Christianity. But we can make some assumptions about what these uh, communities were like. Uh, again, they didn't believe that they were denying Judaism, but they were the fulfillment of this uh, of Judaism and, and its in, and uh, through its belief in the Messiah Jesus. Um, and as we know, Jewish Christians continue to observe the Sabbath and temple rituals. Uh, they gathered together um, to uh, at the temple, and then they would gather together on the first day of the week. Uh, to have this common meal that we today call the Eucharist. And very early on, uh, we see the importance of the Eucharist in the um, communal worship life of Christians. Um, they believed uh, that, um, they believed early on uh, in, in the idea of bishops, priests, and deacons in the threefold uh, ministry in the church, uh, as we'll see in other letters that we will be looking at as well. Um, yes. A question. When did the Christians move from a Sabbath on Saturday versus a Sabbath on Sunday? And what caused that change? Is that much later on? 
Yeah, it is much later. In fact, it isn't until after there is a distinction between what is a Christian and what is a Jew that that began to happen. Once, in other words, once um, the majority of the church was no longer, uh, you know, based in Jerusalem, uh, then it became. And once the you know uh, Jews began cursing Christians in their prayers, it was clear that. You know, we have nothing to do with Judaism any longer. We have nothing to do with the synagogue or the temple. And so our, our, our day of, of worship is, is on Sunday. And so that probably happened in the um, second century. But up until 66 to 70 uh, AD, uh, the, those Jews who were, uh, those Christians who were uh, in Jerusalem, the Jerusalem church, uh, participated in the in temple worship. In other words, the Jews in, in Jerusalem were okay with, uh, with these uh, uh, Christians who followed Jesus as Messiah. They, they took no big offense uh, at them. It's only later on after James is, is killed by Herod and, and then his um, successor is also killed that um, Silvanus that we get um, this distinction uh, that this is what I'm saying that that's Rabbi Daniel Boyer in from UC Berkeley discusses, which is, you know, the, the idea of Judaism is a, is a new concept in a sense. The, the, there was no Judaism in a sense uh, as a religion that existed um, until well after 70 AD and well after the destruction of the temple. Oh, Father, I have a question. Yeah. Um, you said that the early Christian communities had, they had Eucharist and communal meal. Yes. When did we begin a, the for, a formal way of a priest administering communion in, in like a rite or a ritual right. rather than it being a communal that meal? That was happening. There was a common form of worship early on within the first century. Uh, we, um, we have records uh, that go back to Ignatius and I'll show you here in a minute um, what, worship look like and um, but there was a the the, the very forms of, of uh, worship were based on synagogue worship what 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 the, which was a gathering you know there would music would be played some songs would be sung scriptures reading read uh, a sermon would be preached uh, then then there was the breaking of the bread there was the recognition that this was the eating of the body of Christ and drinking his blood which is one of the um, um, uh, heresies that Romans believed was that, that we were cannibals because we were eating the body and blood of Jesus. So there are all kinds of very early on um, signs that um, this was the way Christians were worshiping and uh, this was one of the reasons they were being persecuted as well. Oh. Yeah. I'll show you a slide here we're co coming up about what uh, worship looked like. Um, so uh, again, those God-fearers were that bridge group that St. Paul was able to uh, go after these, the God-fearers. And we hear about them in, in, the, in the 10th chapter of Acts of the Apostles. But as I mentioned, the church in Jerusalem begins to die as a result of the, the death of James and then his successor, uh, Simeon, excuse me. Um, who was the successor to James, and he was later killed by the Romans, um, because possibly he was saying that he had uh, a, a sort of a, a belief in Jesus was being in the line of David, that Christians were followers of somebody who was in the line of David. And so for, for the Romans, anybody who was claiming kingship or being in the, um, uh, a believer, in anybody else who was king was... Um, was was treasonous. And so many of those Jews, many of those Christians, possibly some of them left Jerusalem. And of course, some of them left when the temple was destroyed. So the, the zealots probably finally got what they wanted. They wanted that political violent <clears throat> war and they got it for a period of several years from AD 66 to 70. AD, that's a typo there, 73. Uh, the temple was destroyed in AD 70. And once the temple was destroyed, um, uh, Rome killed about a million, over a million Jews. And 97,000 97, 
were taken captive to be sold into slavery or they were put to death in Roman arenas. So um, at that point, uh, his, many historians used to say that you know, the Christians abandoned Jerusalem and, uh, and left and left for, for Pella. Um, and that theory has, has now fallen into um, uh, this repute is no longer believed that Christians just fled. Many of them were probably killed right there in Jerusalem. Um, and, uh, and, and those who were not killed were simply relocated to Pella. And, um, but once that temple was destroyed, uh, you know, there wasn't much, the, the Sadducees died out and the Pharisees were the winners in a sense because they were already um, in uh, the synagogues. Uh, so Jerusalem was renamed by the, by the Romans, and uh, that uh, later, uh, so essentially the Jewish identity of Jerusalem faded away, and it became a much more Gentile Roman uh, city. Uh, Roman uh, were, houses of worship were built there, uh, and it was very Hellenized and very Romanized. And uh, as a way of clearing the identity, the Ro Romans figured out that these Jews were simply very stiff-necked people and you couldn't trust them. Um, <clears throat> Judaism did survive again in the, in the diaspora through the synagogue movement. Um, Father Munoz, where did the numbers come from? The 1.1 million and the 97,000, those seem pretty, pretty specific numbers. Where did they come from? I don't know exactly. Uh, those were just part of my secondary research into that. And that was what I found in some books that I was researching. So probably um, Josephus is the provider of that information. Uh, he was a historian uh, for the Romans. He was, he was Jewish, but he was a, uh, you know, a, a historian of the time. And so it's likely that the Josephus is the one who records uh, those numbers. Um, and gives us a sense of what, what was going on there. And I, 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 sorry. Go ahead, Susan. Oh, no, finish your question. I had a different question. Hey, go ahead, please. Oh, well, you said that the, the Romans renamed Jerusalem from what to what? Oh, um, oh, God, I just saw that this week. I'd have to take a look at it. Copy, uh, um, uh, Capit Capitolina, Capitolia, something like that. Um, I'll have to take another quick look at that. But they renamed the city I Iolia Capitolina, something like that. You can you can research that. Okay, That's I will. Very common. You can find just Google that and uh, and so they and, really. And then Jerusalem was reestablished as a name when the uh, Jews came back post World War II. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Essentially, uh, from then on, it was always somebody else's land. Hmm. And so for, for Jews, uh, if one were to, to look at what is the, the key uh, problem that Judaism has had uh, since, it, you know, since it began uh, after the Roman, uh, after the destruction of the temple, that's when you really say, when did Judaism begin? It began after the temple was destroyed. Since, since the, that first, since that se first century, um, what Jews have wanted and aspired more than anything else has been the return from exile. And that exile, uh, and that return from exile happened uh, with the, the founding of the nation of Israel and the reestablishment of Jerusalem as the capital. So it was a, a, a moment, the, the destruction, one would have to say that the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple was probably one of the most important uh, and key um, identifiers of Judaism. It was, it defined them for, for, for centuries, for thousands of years. Um, and for, for many, there are many Jews who, Orthodox Jews in, in Israel today who who want the rebuilding of the temple. They believe that, they're, that, that the rebuilding of the temple is required for the Messiah to come. And only when that happens will the Messiah come for the first time for Jews and second time for Christians. 
So it, it is, it is, it is um, um, next to the, next to the bondage of e in Egypt and the Passover and, and the fleeing from Egypt, it is uh, that and, and, and the uh, exodus from Egypt are the two most identifying factors in, in what it means to be a Jew and, and what defines Judaism more than anything else. Wow. And it really was the thing that created the chasm between Christians and Jews. Was there another question? Well, I was going to ask, what triggered the the war? Uh, the zealots? The zealots. They yeah, they finally said, we can't take this anymore. That when and they just they, started attacking soldiers? or Yeah, well, that was what they did a lot, was, but they finally just were able to get an uprising together and do it. Not only that, but they were able to do it again a second time in 135 AD. They were able to, uh, somebody, you know, was able to convince enough Jews that, that he was the Messiah and there was a revolt. And uh, that revolt eventually um, ended uh, at Masada. And, um, and so the, the zealots died out uh, after the destruction, the final destruction of the city. So it was, um, and for a, a, a very brief period of time, Jews had retaken uh, Jerusalem, but that didn't last very long. Rome came back in and, and with great force uh, destroyed uh, Jerusalem again. Father, where was Tel Aviv? And the Christians fled to yeah, uh, it's north towards like towards Syria, you know, Asia Minor, up, up towards oh. it. Okay. Yeah. There couldn't have been that many of them. No, uh, but you know, Rome had huge numbers of soldiers, so they could you know overpower anybody. Mm -hmm. The Romans had spread all over Europe, hadn't they? That time. Okay. Um, so Paul goes out to visit, the, you know, goes on his mission to the Gentiles. And, uh, you know, he has missions throughout um, uh, three, we, we, we talk about the three missionary journeys of Paul. Um, first one was with Barnabas, but he goes out to Cyprus and Asia Minor and Greece and Rome, possibly even to Spain is what the legends say which is why, and, and Peter was supposedly, uh, you know, was able to go on a missionary journey to Spain as well. And so that's why Peter and Paul are two very influential names within uh, Spain. Uh, in fact, they, they have a feast day on June 29th together. Uh, Saint, uh, the feast of St. Peter and St. Paul is on June 29th, which is my birthday. And as is common in, um, in um, uh, Spanish cultures, you, your middle name is is uh, comes from the um, uh, the day that you were born, and so I was born uh, Frank Peter Paul Munoz. I dropped the Paul and kept the Peter, uh, but um, that was the influence of, of Peter and Paul in Spain it was huge because of the legends of their um, missionary journeys to Spain. We don't know for sure whether that was uh, true or not. Um, but Paul was beheaded as a, Roman, uh, as a Roman citizen would. Peter, being not a Roman citizen, was not uh, beheaded. Uh, he was crucified upside down. We'll talk about that uh, here. Uh, there we go. Peter suffered martyrdom in Rome under Nero. Um, and Paul was beheaded. Um, and, um, uh, well, you know, again, as I mentioned, there's the, the theory or the legend of Paul having traveled to Spain. Then we have some legends about the Apostle John. Um, and, um, uh, you know, John is um, uh, mentioned uh, by different, there's maybe different, it's hard to really figure out which John we're talking about. John is a very common name back then, like Mary was. And so it, it um, but the legend about John is that he lived well into late first century and, dust, and died at an old age, um, and uh, well after the martyrdoms of Peter and Paul. All the other legends that might have existed are, are numerous, like Thomas going to India, 
Joseph of Arimathea going to Britain, Mark going to Alexandria, to Egypt, uh, and the Byzantine church being founded by Philip. So there are all kinds of legends of, of, of the apostles, but none of them we can really say are true history. We just have to accept them as, as legendary uh, stories. Conflicts with the state, with the state of Rome. Now, um, uh, you know, Christianity has some pretty conflicted beginnings. You know, it, uh, it said Jesus was Lord. Well, to, just to say Jesus is Lord is really a treasonous act. And so um, uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was very much a be careful who you say is Lord, because the only Lord is the emperor. Uh, but, you know, Christianity said that Jesus was Lord. And so that creates a source of potential conflict for them. Um, then the other source of conflict is that Jesus talked about this kingdom of God. Well, what about the kingdom of the Romans, you know, the Roman Empire? Well, again, Jesus talked about this. That's another source of potential conflict. Uh, you know, James, the brother of John, is beheaded by Herod. Uh, the zealots, you know, uh, create a war, a Jewish uprising. You know, Christians are fleeing uh, to Pella or being relocated there. It was, it had, Christianity had a conflicted beginning and the Roman Empire took note of that. But once it was no longer just a Jewish sect of Judaism, that's when the Romans began to take notice. And because so many of the converts were now non-Jews but Gentiles, that's when Rome begins to start looking at them and saying, hey, what's really going on here? Who are you guys? And um, if you're no longer really part of Judaism, right? Well, if you're no longer part of Judaism, then you gotta do the emperor worship thing uh, and light the incense. Um, and um, clearly now Jews are rejecting Christianity uh, and, um, and, and um, Christianity is rejecting Judaism. And so there is this divide that is beginning to happen and um, many of the Jewish uh, zealots and nationalists who were still in Jerusalem or in, in the area thought, you know, it's, it's, it's us uh, tolerating these Christians that has brought God's wrath upon us. And the only way we're going to be in, in, um, in, in receiving God's blessings is if we repudiate uh, Christianity even more. Uh, and so uh, that repudiation comes uh, further by the very state. Uh, Claudius uh, decides to expel these Jews who must have been uh, seen really, who were really Christians, but Claudius expels them uh, because he says, the Roman historian Suetonius says that uh, they're, the reason that they're being expelled is because they believe in this uh, Chris, Christus, which is probably Christ. Uh, and, uh, and there was obviously disputes between Jews and Christians breaking out in Rome. And Claudius just said, look, you guys go settle your argument, but don't create commotion here in Rome. And so they are essentially expelled. Uh, Jews and Christians are expelled from Rome for a period of time. And as I mentioned, the, the distinctions become clearer and clearer uh, as time goes on and Rome begins to take notice of that. And that becomes the basis for um, some of the um, persecutions. The first persecution happens with Nero who, um, uh, you know, uh, begins to persecute the church in around AD 64. And what did he do? He, of course, we all know about the fact that he, you know, became emperor. And uh, at first he was probably a fairly good emperor. Uh, and, uh, but eventually he got infatuated with his own grandeur. And um, he, uh, he's blamed uh, for a fire that consumes 10 out of 14 districts in Rome. And um, people initially blamed thought it was Nero who was doing it. There were stories of him, you know, uh, playing the, uh, a, a, a liar and dressed as an actor and singing and all this. It was a very unpopular person. And, and Nero decides that his, um, you know, his scapegoat is going to be the Christians. So he blames the Christians for the fire that broke out. Uh, it, it was like a fire that took like six days and nights. Uh, you can imagine how much of Rome burned and how it affected uh, the life of people there. After uh, Nero is deposed, he commits suicide. And um, the, the, years, the year after uh, Nero's 
death, there were four different emperors that um, arose. Um, Galba, Otho, Vitellius, and finally Vespasian, uh, who takes power in the year 69 and rules for about 10 years. And he founds what's called the Flavian dynasty. Then after Nero, we get in, in Vespasian, we've got Titus, who's the son of Vespasian. Uh, and he's the, the one who's responsible. Titus is the one who's responsible for the fall and the destruction of the temple. Um, and um, uh, then that we've got, uh, after that, we've got Domitian, who was the brother of Titus and also a son of Vespasian. Um, and then under Domitian was when we get some real heavy duty uh, first persecution. Um, he has a great love for Roman tradition. Uh, and, and so that leads to his, you know, despising the Christians who didn't um, observe the Roman uh, customs of emperor worship. Uh, Jews didn't do very well under him either. Uh, he even uh, required them to send their annual offering that they would normally send to the temple that it have to be sent to the imperial coffers. Um, and so they, there was an annual temple tax and he collected that instead. So that of course created a lot of, of uh, uproar amongst the Jewish population in Rome. Um, and so Jews and Christians essentially were persecuted during this time. And the closer you were close, the closer you were to Rome, the more persecution you could expect. Out in the hinterland, uh, if, if you weren't, you know, making trouble, essentially you were exempt from the persecution. But, you know, Domitian didn't stop with just, you know, persecuting um, non-relatives. He even, um, you know, killed um, uh, Clemens, uh, Flavius Clemens and his wife uh, Flavia uh, because they were practicing Judaism. And uh, because they were practicing Judaism, they were obviously atheists because they didn't believe in the emperor as a god. So martyrdom begins now um, in the first and second centuries. Again, it began a little bit with Nero. That really wasn't a sort of a, uh, you know, empire-wide kind of thing. Um, it was something that was very much located to, to Rome itself. But outside of Rome, there was a, uh, uh, a, a new governor called uh, Pliny, uh, Gaius Plinus uh, Secundus, otherwise known as um, Pliny the Younger. And um, he writes a letter to the Emperor Trajan uh, asking for guidance as to what to do with these, these uh, upstart Christians. He begins to investigate them and he admits that uh, after questioning them a second and third time and threatening them with death and uh, death sentence, uh, that they, um, uh, are, are, they, they refuse to do uh, the emperor worship. And so um, uh, he is seeking guidance from uh, Plagian as to what to do with them. Um, and he says that, you know, after he's um, investigated, he's, he's not really finding real crimes other than simply the, the, they seem to be good people. Uh, they're they're stiff-necked, uh, but they seem to be, um, uh, you know, really not big criminals. They seem to be good people. And so uh, he, he reports that um, they gather uh, before dawn to sing hymns to Christ as, as to God. They swear uh, oaths not to commit uh, theft or adultery. Uh, they gather for a common meal. And, uh, and so again, you can see this is happening, you know, around the first or second century there. And, um, uh, you know, and that's all that they're really guilty of. And so he wanted to know from Trajan what to do. And Trajan says, you know, um, look, as long as don't, don't take, whoops, don't take anonymous, um, don't take the anonymous word of people. Looks like my PowerPoint may be wanting to close on me. Don't take other people's words simply that they are bad. Uh, don't arrest them if they're anonymous persecutions. Here, my PowerPoint closed. Let me reopen it. It'll be a moment. Um, leave them alone. Don't go out and, and persecute them if, uh, if, if, if unnecessary. Um, and um, uh, get that going here. Uh, any questions so far? We're getting close to our time here in 10 minutes. Give me a little bit, because we had some technical difficulties. Anybody have a problem? If you need to get off, of course, 
you feel free to give it off, but I just want to go another 10 or 20 minutes and, um, uh, and there we go. It's okay, maybe if we go a little longer. Okay, thank you so much. I want to be able to finish and I really want to get to Marcion and the Marcionite challenge. Um, it really the Younger was basically a good guy in Roman terms. Yeah. And uh, he, was a, he was a provincial administrator and basically what he proposed uh, and got permission from Trajan to do was just kind of lay off the Christians, you know? Yeah, yeah. And well, we're not going to let people get the anonymous denunciations we're not going to do. And, yeah, yeah. You know, we weren't going to chase them down. You know, if you stumbled over them and they wouldn't, you know, would burn incense and that stuff, yeah, maybe. But he was a witness to the uh, the uh, eruption of Vesuvius that wiped out Pompeii yeah. and Herculaneum. And his, his essay on that, his descriptions of what, of what happened during that, you know, he watched it from afar, is still used by volcanologists today. Wow. Yeah, he was he was quite the beginning of uh, of the observation of uh, of uh, volcanoes and how they how they what what their dynamics were. Yeah, and so there were Christians who were um, who were basically okay. Yeah, I used to be a Christian, not anymore. What do I got to do to not get arrested and killed? Well, they would recant. They would curse Christ and they would light the incense and do the emperor worship. And so, uh, but basically, as you said, you know, Trajan was like, well, just leave them alone. It's not our policy to go out there and, and kill them yet. So uh, we'll, we'll sort of tolerate them somewhat. Uh, but there are other emperors that, that, that do go a little bit further. Uh, as we, we talked about Nero, Domitian, Marcus Aurelius as well, even though he was a very wise, learned, philosopher uh, did do some persecution of even people who were close to him, servants. Uh, then we've got, uh, you know, Decius, um, who, uh, you know, the, the three Ds, Decius, Diocletian, and Domitian were the, the three Ds of the, the big persecutors of, of Christianity. Uh, and uh, they were the ones who really uh, laid it into uh, Christians. Uh, that was Domitian, Decius, and Diocletian. Um, so with Decius begins sort of the first empire-wide uh, persecution of the church. Uh, Decius uh, blamed the Christians for the decline of the Roman Empire, believing that the gods were angry due to its toleration of Christianity. And this eventually turned into a desire to completely eradicate Christianity. Remember, Rome was already beginning to feel some deterioration in its empire and began to looking for reasons for that uh, decline. Uh, one of the um, more famous uh, martyrs of, the t of that time was Ignatius of Antioch. He was a bishop, um, and um, uh, he was condemned to death in 107. Um, he had written some letters uh, to various different churches. Here we are, the letters of uh, Ignatius. Uh, and he sort of very sort of, um, heroically went to his death in Rome. And uh, even though he you know, what, during his travels through Asia Minor on his way to Rome, he was visited by many uh, Christians all, along the way. Uh, he and people were trying to convince him not to submit to martyrdom, and, uh, it, but eventually he, he does, and he wants to go uh, to his death. He feels that, that would be uh, the, the right way of honoring Christ, and, um, and so he eventually is martyred, but we, we because of his letters that he's uh, that he wrote, we get a kind of a glimpse of what the early church was like. Uh, what was the, the faith uh, of, of early Christians? And it was really a confirmation of the faith that we see in Paul's letters. Um, it was, um, he, he talked about uh, the importance and the insistence of having bishops, priests, and deacons. He talked about the Eucharistic theology, and, and we already get here uh, examples of what worship was like. And so very early on, around 100 AD, we begin to see that regardless of the, the different ways of being church, that there were some common elements of church. But early Christianity was as different as, as Christianity is today different. You know, you can go down the street and you can find uh, different ways of being the church today. And same way was back then, but there were beginning to gel some common elements. Uh, martyrdom was something that, of course, uh, was not something that um, was um, 
promoted, uh, but in, um, but it did become, as Tertullian later says, sort of the, the, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. It is seen as, uh, as inspiring to the Romans. As I, look at these people. Why are they going to their death? Um, they must be, they, they must have courage. And so there, there is a, um, an appeal uh, that martyrdom brings to the Gentile and the Roman world. And um, they're, they refuse to recant um, and, uh, and they, they don't resist arrest and, um, uh, and, and, and they refuse to curse Christ. They go bravely to their death. Um, and, um, and that was in, in inspiring uh, to the early church um, and to uh, many who were uh, new believers to the church. But the church believed, and the early church believed, that certainly martyrdom was not for everybody. It shouldn't be something spontaneous. It should be something that you feel a, a real sense of divine calling to do. And, and because that was, it was a calling because it was something that God was calling you to do, not something that you felt you needed to do to impress other people. Having to defend the faith, however, was really important. Uh, and the need to defend the faith was done by what are called apologists. And uh, the word apology is the word that comes from when one offers an apology today, we think of it as offering a defense of yourself or an excuse. And so the apologist had came into prominence because the um, Christians were being accused of all kinds of things. Uh, we get apologists like uh, that we see in, in, in letters like Clement of Rome, who was the Bishop of Rome. And he wrote to the Corinthian church to settle disputes there. We have Ignatius of Antioch, which we just talked about there, who wrote those seven letters, uh, and he traveled to Rome. And then we get a, a book that many of you are not familiar with. It's called the, the Didache, D-I-D-A-C-H-E, the Didache. And it's a short little book. It's, it's, uh, you can find it on the internet, uh, and Google it, and you can read it. And it gives you, uh, it's in two parts. The first part is about uh, Christian beliefs, Christian doctrine, and the second part is about about church practice. And even from there, in the Didache, we get examples of what early church worship looked like. So to answer your question, Jeannie, that was the Didache would be a good book to take a look at. And again, it's very brief. It's it'll take you probably 15 minutes to read. It it is a, a very brief uh, example of what Christians were believing and how they were uh, how how they were worshiping. Um, so. Uh, what were the Christians being accused of? Well they, well, they were being accused of all kinds of crazy things from, first of all, being atheists because they wouldn't worship the emperor. They were seen as antisocial uh, people. Um, they didn't go to the, to the games. They didn't offer worship to the pagan deities. They rejected abortion and, uh, and the exposure of inf in, 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 in infants. Uh, a Roman family, uh, if, they, they did, if it was a boy, they kept them. If it was a girl, they, you know, would throw them out in the streets and they would let them out to die. And Christians were, you know, grabbing these babies and infants and, and caring for them. And uh, this is where they were getting accused then later that they would be sacrificing these babies and, uh, and eating their flesh and their blood. And so they were accused of all kinds of things. Uh, they, uh, they, they, they didn't permit divorce. Um, and, um, and disapproved of, of, um, of the way Roman society was treating widows and, and divorced women. Um, and uh, Christians weren't fighting in the army because they were opposed to violence and, and in serving in the army involved the worship of, of pagan gods and the killing of other people. Um, so there were all kinds of things that, you know, that be, they were being accused of. And so um, uh, incest, oh, incest, that was another thing that, that they were being accused of because you know, they were referring to each other as brother and sister. <laughs> uh, and so there were all kinds of rumors and the blame game was certainly big. Uh, even the worship of Christ as a donkey, there was graffiti um, that was found uh, where it's a, uh, it's a figure of a man on a crucifixion, on, on, a, cru on a cross, and a head of a donkey. Uh, and, uh, and it says, Alex Amenos uh, worships uh, a donkey. Uh, and uh, so Christians were mocked, uh, and they were not seen 
as, as, as favorable to the society, to Roman society. And in comes one of the most uh, important apologists is Justin Martyr, who um, wrote his first apology to the emperor Antonius Pius in 151. And um, uh, he said basically that Christ uh, is, 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 is what unifies us and is the criterion of truth. Um, he thinks of, he says that, um, uh, Justin says that he is the light of light. Uh, he is uh, begotten, but, not, but distinct from the Father. Uh, so from here, we begin to get, um, from Justin, we begin to get glimpses of what a Trinitarian theology will be like later on. He, um, he uh, uh, you know, believes in, in um, uh, the Old Testament, uh, and, the, and the unity of the Old Testament and uh, in Christ. And so uh, that later on becomes, uh, for, for uh, Marcion, who we'll talk about here in a minute, um, that unity between Old Testament and the new writings and the new uh, Jesus is something that, um, uh, is, that linkage is what Justin Martyr is trying to do, is to link the Old Testaments and the prophecy of Christ with their belief in Christ. And so later on, that would be a source of tension for, uh, for Marcion. Um, so he is a, offers, offers a defense of the faith, a defense in the resurrection of Jesus, in the resurrection of other Christians as well. And he writes these defenses and these apologies uh, as a way of convincing others that, uh, that Christians are moral people with high moral standards and that they should not be persecuted. Um, in Justin, we also get a little bit of uh, idea of uh, worship. Uh, you know that. You know he details what happens on the Lord's Day when Christians come together. They celebrate the Eucharist. Uh, they, they eat the Eucharist after the baptism. So the two main uh, sacraments are happening already in the early church, as early as as uh, you know in the early hundreds. Um, and so he was uh, a proponent also about um, the, that Jesus was the Logos that is talked about in, um, in the Stoic philosophy that in the Gospel of John reflects basically that a theology of Justin or that Justin has adopted that theology that is in the Gospel of John. Even the early church back then recognized that John's Gospel was a, a more spiritual Gospel and really a... Um, uh, uh, very different than the, than the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So basically, all these apologists are, char are char defending the charges of, uh, that we're not atheists. They defend the objections to the resurrection of the dead, of our immortality, uh, you know, and um, um, of, Im of immorality, excuse me, and uh, that they were not subversive. So uh, they, they, they do not worship the emperor, but they have a true emperor, which is God, and they want to be good and loyal subjects. So how Christ, what the apologists are trying to do is they're trying to create a way for Christians to be able to coexist in this um, Roman Empire. And that's what becomes a, sort of the preoccupation of the early churches. You know, no longer we have to worry about defending ourselves against Jews. It's how do we fit into Roman society? How do we fit into the civil ceremonies? How can we still serve in the military? And so um, how, how that relationship between faith and culture is going to happen. All right, so we're down to our last uh, section here. I'll be, we'll be done in a few minutes here. Uh, in the early church, there was uh, two movements that really were very much um, competitors for the attention of, of Greeks and Romans. And that was the Gnostic movement and the Marcionite movement. The Gnostics believed, and this was a, was, was a, not a, again, a religion, but it was a, there were many different Gnostic movements and it existed as sort of a, a, a as, and it transcended various different forms of Christianity, but it really did begin to invade Christianity and shape a lot of, of, of uh, second century writings that we get and that eventually were rejected by the church. But basically, what Gnostics believed was that Jesus left a special knowledge to his apostles and which has been passed down orally. And they believed that the world 
was created um, in a pre-cosmic disaster, which accounted for the present misery uh, and lot of life. They believed that a certain few had a divine spark and that had, the, that had become imprisoned in matter and had lost its memory of its true heavenly home. So there was matter and there was spirit. And the goal was of Gnostics was to, to live a very ascetic life, but really focus on the spiritual life and arouse the soul, arouse the soul from this sleepwalking that we're all in, uh, to make it aware of the high destiny to which it was called and uh, to shed the evil powers that, um, that existed uh, to bring the soul down. So it was, it was, a, it was, into, it was, it was into planets and, um, and um, planetary powers and, and all kinds of, of things that, that we could take an entire hour just talking about Gnosticism. Um, but uh, they believed in that this material world was something that we could escape from by being initiated into this secret knowledge and that that secret knowledge would bring the actual real salvation that one uh, aspired to and that we needed to. So this was a very challenging um, ideas that, that had to be uh, put down by the defenders of the faith and by the church. And so we spent a lot of time in the early church um, trying to put down this Gnostic movement uh, or sometimes called Gnostic Christianity and, uh, and Gnostic Gospels that were written, like the Gospel of Thomas uh, that was written, uh, where, where Jesus seems to come across as this spiritual being, not a human person, uh, but this spiritual being who um, is here to impart this special knowledge of salvation to all people. Then we've got Marcion. Marcion is this um, uh, young priest who is um, his father was a bishop, so he's raised a Christian, uh, but his fa even his father excommunicated him. And later on, when he goes to Rome, uh, Rome excommunicates this young man um, who is, you know, um, very um, soft. Uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a salesman. Uh, he's very much a, 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 a you know, um, sweet-talking kind of guy. Uh, he's got youth. He's got looks. He's got money. And so because he's being excommunicated by everybody left and right, he founds and sets up his own church uh, with his own teachings. But here's the key ideas of, of Marcion, which is he rejects everything that's he Jewish, rejects uh, he, the Hebrew world. He says that the God of the Old Testament is not the same God of Jesus. There's a, a, a mean, evil God um, in the Old Testament who's, you know, very... Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, angry and killing people all the time. And then there's this God of love, which is the God of Jesus. And um, I think we can probably see some of the appeal. And actually, this Marcionite Christianity that he established was a direct um, threat to Christianity. It was so widespread that it became, at one point, like I said, almost not quite, almost a dominant form of Christianity back then. Um, you know, and it, you could see this with the, the, the separation between Judaism and Christianity that was now happening, or had happened now. Now, there were those who wanted to drive that separation even deeper. So Marcion only accepted uh, the Gospel of Luke, and, and really only parts of the Gospel of Luke. He wanted to sanitize the whole New Testament, or all the books that were being used by the early church, sanitize it from all... Hebraic and Jewish references. So he only accepts parts of, uh, of most of Luke, but, but the latter half of Luke, accepts Galatians, accepts first and second uh, Corinthians, um, Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, and Philippians. The rest of it he throws out, rejects the entire Old Testament. So the church is really challenged by this. And this challenge requires that the church now establish and accelerate what it needs to do. And it, here's what the church does in response to this Marcionite heresy. It creates a canon of scripture, you know, a, a rule. We're going to get to that in a, the apostolic creed and the apostolic succession. Now I'm going to touch on each of these three ideas here briefly. First, the word canon 
uh, the canon of scripture means, literally the word canon means read or rule. And Christians in the second century, uh, of course, recognized the Old Testament, the Greek Old Testament called the Septuagint. Um, and um, they, uh, the early church says, we're going to recognize uh, four gospels and we're gonna recognize the letters of Paul. Um, and it said, um, you know, those in any other, any other writings out there, we're not going to accept. But Marcion, I said, creates his own list of, of scriptures. And I mentioned some of them right now to you. So the church said, we're going to recognize these books and not these books. Now, there was no council that met yet. Uh, it was simply, what is it that is, um, expresses the faith that we share? Uh, and what is the faith that, uh, that has been taught to us? Um, and uh, what sounds reasonable to us? You know, what's, what's commonly being used? What has apostolic origins? Okay. Uh, and if it doesn't have an apostolic origin, it's probably not uh, a, a valuable book. So the church sets up what's called a creed. And a creed is nothing more than simply, um, for the early church, a way of, of saying, here's what we believe. Here's a quality control document, you know, so that what we're passing on in faith is what we all believe. And um, the first uh, creed that the church establishes is called the Apostolic or the, Apo the Apostles, which we, uh, of course, recite uh, often when we do a baptism because of the fact that it is a, a uh, it was the, uh, it was used in a sense as an interrogation. Uh, question. Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty? And, the, and our baptismal rite uh, creates that back and forth question and answer. Do you believe in God? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? These are the questions that are asked of somebody who is coming into the church and being initiated. And that what's in the Mars, what's in the Apostles' Creed is, um, is, is, is something that was a, a, a way of refuting Marcionism, because it requires that you believe in the God of the Old Testament. It requires that you believe that um, in, in, in the, the virgin birth, uh, Mary, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. You know, all this is a way of affirming the Jesus' Jewish origins. Uh, and so it was something that was a way of saying, Marcion, uh, you, can't, uh, you can't be a Christian and be a Marcionite. You, you must be able to affirm the Apostles' Creed. Um, and that creed began to take shape between, you know, 150 to all the way into the, the late 6th century, or excuse me, 8th century. Uh, so from 1st century, from 2nd uh, century all the way to um, the 8th century, slowly develops. Uh, so it is essentially a response to uh, the Gnostics and to the Marcionites. The next thing that takes, the, the, the second response comes in the way of affirming the importance of what it was called apostolic succession. And it's who's got the authority to decide matters of faith and practice. And by the third century, we, as I said, we've got the Apostles' Creed, we have a canon of, of, of accepted books, and now we have a form of government for the church, and that is the apostles. Uh, and by second century, uh, as I said earlier, the, uh, Ignatius of Antioch, he's a bishop, and uh, it was a way of establishing unity. The bishop was the unifying force uh, of, of the early church. Uh, he says, for example, Ignatius of Antioch said, do you follow your bishop as Jesus Christ followed the father? Do nothing without the bishop. <laughs> and, and certainly in the Episcopal church, in the Catholic, Roman Catholic Church, the Orthodox Church, <coughs> churches that have bishops, it is very much a way of bringing unity uh, to the early Christian movement. And so by even as late as 180, by as early as 180 BC, we have bishops who are heads of local churches. And then the priests, the presbyters, are the secondary leaders. They're the assistants to the bishops. And then you've got deacons. And so we have these three offices very early on in the church. And Ignatius of Antioch uh, uh, argued very strenuously uh, for the keeping of this kind of threefold 
uh, leadership. Um, the apostles were still the supreme authority, but after the apostles, it's the bishops who were seen as having the final authority for faith and life. And so what we get essentially now is what's called the Catholic Church. Again, the universal church, that's what the word Catholic means, means universal. And um, Ignatius says by, that by following your bishop, you avoid the divisions. You know, he says, let that be considered a valid Eucharist over which the bishop presides or one to whom he commits it, which would be the priest. So as early as 110, we're seeing um, the, the idea that the bishop and the priests have an important role in the establishment of the faith. And so with that, that completes our presentation today. Uh, I'm sorry I ran over a little time, but we had those technical difficulties. Um, and I'll take any questions that you may have. I've sent, uh, we've um, sent this to you as a, P as a PDF document. So you can take a look at, in case you fell asleep, like my wife over there, who's fallen asleep, uh, you know, I'm and, not feeling well. Oh, she's not feeling well. I thought you were. No, I have a little. Really Father, a I have a quick. Oh, I'm okay. Go ahead, Edna. Go ahead. A lot, a lot to digest. I yes. Oh, and God. you don't have to digest all of it. Oh, but, I hope we review some of it because it was okay, very well, interesting, but I was lost. Well, you can, you've got the PDF. You can take a look at that. And if you've got any oh, questions okay. as a result of, of, of looking at the PDF, I can always come back to those uh, again. And it, and. Uh, I will try to give you, um, again, a more streamlined version uh, next week um, with the part two. And, uh, um, you know, for, it, it wouldn't be so much, it wouldn't be so bad, I think, if you had to do, if, if you did some of the reading. Uh, Susan, you've been reading the chapters, right? Yes. And uh, so I follow very um, faithfully the chapters um, uh, in the book and the subsections and everything it's, so it's um one of the the things that i found a little bit difficult in reading the chapters and you actually filled in is that he kind of concentrates on what happened and less on the the faith or the philosophy philosophy as you've taken it to a little bit more on that he did go into the um the gnostics and the marcionites and what they believe but i think you went into it in more depth so I, that, you know, having done EFM, which did a lot more delving into the spiritual end of what was going on historically, um, I, I find it's a little bit, it's, it's helpful, but the rest of it is, is um, it's sort of in there. And we, we actually spent some time in EFM and we read the Didache and we used to do that service oh, okay. um, at, the be, at the beginning of, of some of our meetings, our special meetings, if you will. Right. And, it was quite an experience to do that together. Wonderful. But what a lot of research on your part, Father. Oh, God. yeah. I love it. Uh, this is uh, wow. I, I, my 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 um, my um, master's work was a, a lot done um, in historical theology, uh, mm -hmm. and I was a, a I loved his his church history. I have fantastic um, history professors, uh, church history professors in at Loyola Marymount, um, mm -hmm. and. Um, um, and then I've just I've had some, some great professors in graduate school and, uh, and uh, um, you know, I really have well, taught it was church history before, so I really enjoy it. And, um, and I'm enjoying this. I'm really, I sp I've spent my whole week reading and researching and um, um, actually not just this week, but, you know, months ago when I was beginning to get ready for the classes that I was going to be teaching at the School mm -hmm. for Ministry, I was doing uh, a lot of reading and um, putting the PowerPoints together and all that kind of stuff. I really enjoy it. This is my... Well, I, I enjoyed it, but it's a lot for this little peanut brain. To yeah. Well, I, I, I really like the way you brought the um, the spirituality into it. Mm. Great. I a lot there. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm glad you enjoy it. You don't have to absorb it. There is no test. There's no <laughs> code. That's the good thing. There's no papers to write, no projects to do. But um, it'd be nice when we're all together again, face to face yeah. and uh, have more time to... Fantastic. It, I can't, can't wait for that to happen. I can't it, To me, it's always interesting the way this level of, of knowledge of our religion actually um, makes parts of the, the Sunday service more meaningful and um, 
it makes me more able to explain my religion uh, when other people ask. Yeah, well, this is the goal, I guess, I, what, what's, what would be the goal of this course is for all of you to have a deeper appreciation for our worship. Um, we already see that, you know, the way we're worshiping now is very much the way the early church was worshiping. Right. Right. You know, and that brings a sense of historical continuity. And it, sends, it brings a sense of, okay, this is not something we just made up. You know, <laughs> this is something that, that, has, that pre-exists my history. And it makes you wonder, well, you know, this is the way the early church was doing it. You know, uh, is going to a, 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 is listening to a, a 45 minutes of rock music uh, in, a, in a big auditorium, uh, you know, clapping your hands. Is that the way to worship? Well, a lot of people are very attracted to that. Um, and uh, we'll, as we'll discover in our last uh, uh, session, you know, that's the way Christianity is emerging. You know, it's emerging in new forms. Uh, I think this, this whole quarantine thing is also another um, uh, moment in time when it's forcing the church to look at itself and say, well, how are we going to worship in the future? And yeah. how, how will this change us? Will it change us? Um, so, it's really like coming through. Yeah. So, anyways. Well, thank you, Father. That was very informative. But well, thank you. I, thanks, Janice, for your input there on Pliny. Pliny. Um, and um, uh, anybody else have any other questions? If not, then we'll sign off and go to lunch, I suppose. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. We'll thank see you all next week for, for yeah. work and for um, instruction for Christian adult education. Thank you for joining me. Take care. Thank you. Thank, Stay thank cool. you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank Bye. you. Bye. You're welcome.